when you were a kid, your family moved a lot. Mm -hmm. I understand altogether you lived in like 43, I mean, 23 different countries. Um, oh, okay. And uh, spending the most amount of time in Greece, Iran, and Switzerland. Yeah. Of course, I don't know how old you were in each one, but I wanted to ask you about each of those countries, but especially about Iran. Since that's kind of on a lot of people's minds these days, how old were you, and and what do you remember of Iran? My dad was an engineer, a civil engineer, specializing in big projects. Mm -hmm. He was the senior resident soils engineer for Disney Phase One, Two, Three, Epcot and Studio Center. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. he, you know, he was a foundations guy. He was, you know, he made sure that stuff didn't fall down or sink. Mm. and he got hired to go over to Iran to work on a very, very large petrochemical pro uh, plant between Abadan and Bandar Shapur, a little closer to Bandar Shapur. At that time, I had lived in a number of places in the southeastern United States. I traveled around the eastern United States a fair amount, but had never lived overseas, never gone overseas, and... So in 1973, um, in October, we packed up and moved to Iran. And you can feel free to hum the theme from the Beverly Hillbillies, <laughs> which was one hell of a culture shock, um, if for no other reason than because Iran was a very cosmic, Tehran at the time was a very, very cosmopolitan city. Um, there mm -hmm. were 14,000 Americans living there. It was a city of 3 million, I believe. And most of the people that I dealt with were internationalists. I didn't have a lot of friends my own age. I mostly hung out with my parents' friends who were professors and engineers and doctors and lawyers. And, and to, you know, the school that I went to was, you know, there's tiers to private schools. And it was the second tier of private school. Olivee being the, the, the best one, I went to community school, which was, uh, the kids were 80% Iranian, but they all spoke English, and the foreign kids were diplomats, middle managers, engineers, kids, all of whom were kids who traveled around overseas all the time. Hmm. About half of the, the remainder were American. The other were a polyglot. My best friend in fifth and sixth grade uh, was a Yugoslavian. Hmm. You know, hmm. back when that was Tito and they were communists and all that stuff, he was a, a Bosnian, specifically. So it was a very interesting experience. The lived quote in Switzerland was, uh, I actually went to summer camp <laughs> in Switzerland. <laughs> Oh, okay. <laughs> I don't usually associate Switzerland with summer. <laughs> well, it was um, uh, it was a you know a little little bit hell, a little slice of heaven. Um, it was in the Valais region, about a place called Montana. You know, the only thing that anybody knows is it was directly across the Valais from Zermatt. It was due north of Zermatt. You know, when I walked out in the morning. And it was all almost invariably very, very clear. The first thing you saw, like seventy-five miles away, was the Matterhorn. <laughs> wow! <laughs> yeah, <laughs> it was pretty freaking cool. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It sounds like Heidi or The Sound of Music or something. Very much so. Um, the the uh, the equestrian instructor, who was also the the senior guy for, you know, physical education guy, mm -hmm. was, uh, his, his day job, essentially, was, he was a professional yodeler. <laughs> you can make a living at that? He went to yodeling competition. I don't know <laughs> yeah. if it was really his day job, but, mm. you know, his, his big thing was that he was a yodeler. And, uh, that's where I fell in love with Toblerone chocolate. But, yeah, living in Iran was a, was a very interesting experience. Uh, I wouldn't give it up for the world. Uh, I hated it most of the time that I was there, but, you know, the experience was just immense. Uh, my mom was really into traveling. You know, she, she always enjoyed seeing new places, meeting new people. So do I. And so while we were over there, we traveled a good bit. That was, uh, boy, um, where all that 
ago. Well, what happened was in 1975, things were starting to get pretty bad in Iran, and you could kind of see the handwriting on the wall. There was going to be a revolution sooner or later. Mm. So to make sure that I wasn't around for it, they sent me home to live with my brother and sister-in-law in Mm -hmm. Alexandria, Alabama, Mm. which the year before had just gotten a blinking light. By blinking light, you you mean that they had no traffic light. They just had a a, a caution light, so to speak. Correct. Oh, okay, okay. So I went from a cosmopolitan city of 3 million people where the people that I was hanging out with were professors and engineers and spies Mm -hmm. to a teensy, tiny little town in Alabama. Mm. I had an English accent. (laughs) <laughs> you can imagine how well that went over. Oh, yeah, they love that. Oh, yeah. <laughs> so I was there from October 9th until May 12th. May 12th, my mom having said, send John over because she was trying to pry my dad out of, uh, of Iran. My dad had a tendency to stay around on projects long after he needed to leave in my mother's opinion. And the way that she would deal with that is she would pick up the family and move someplace else. Oh. And dad would, dad would have, dad would have the choice of following or not. She would lure him away. Yes. She had gone to Greece and she told my brother and sister-in-law to send me to Greece. So my sister-in-law turned, I found out later was supposed to come over with me. But what actually happened was (laughs) at six o'clock at night, I was put on a plane in Birmingham, Alabama, Mm -hmm. and the next day I decanted in Athens, Greece, having flown the whole way myself. (laughs) Mm. (laughs) How old were you? (laughs) Thirteen. Oh, okay. (laughs) I've been been traveling a lot at that point. The really Mm -hmm. fun part was when I got to Greece, Mm -hmm. my mom had gone to the domestic airport. Yeah. So she wasn't even at the airport. I got to the airport. I cleared customs on my own. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I got out to where I expected mom to be. Back then, it was like, you know, right outside of customs you could go to. It wasn't, you know, like now. And I expected mom to be there. She wasn't there. So I waited around a little while and then, uh, you know, had her paged. And, you know, she didn't respond to the page. And that was about, I don't know, 30 minutes or so after I'd after I landed. Mm-hmm. And then I got paged. Mm. And it was her calling from the the domestic airport, which was all the way across Athens. Mm. Mm-hmm. And she said, you know, I went to the wrong air- airport. And I'll be over there, you know, really quick. And I said, Mom, don't worry about it. What hotel are we in? <laughs> and and she goes, we're, she goes we're, we're at the Hilton. And I said, okay. You know, I didn't know if it was the Hilton Hilton or the Grand Britannia. I could have been either one. Mm -hmm. I said, okay, I'll meet you at the hotel. (laughs) (laughs) So I went out, dragging my, you know, carrying my luggage. Mm -hmm. You you know, you didn't have wheels back then. Yeah, yeah. And uh, flagged a taxi and told told them, you know, Athens Hilton. Mm -hmm. And he took me to the Hilton. And when I got there, I said, hang on a second. I went up to the, uh, you know, went up to the bell captain. Mm Mm-hmm. And I said, uh, you know, my mom went to the wrong airport, we're checked in, I don't have any money to pay the cab. If you, you know, pay the cab for me and I'll make sure, you know, you get reimbursed. Mm -hmm. Um, And he paid the cab and, you know, I explained the problem to the front desk. They let me into the room. Mm -hmm. So I was in the room with my feet propped up with a drink (laughs) when my mom got there. <laughs> and and alcoholic and mimosa to be precise. What? <laughs> because for the last nine months I've been in Alabama and I hadn't had to, been able to have a drink. Oh. 